This is Past Force. We can all agree that the recent toppling of the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol was definitely a good thing. He profited from slavery, he profited from the suffering and misery of other people, and he's not a man who, in this day and age, we should be having statues of in our city centres. But, following the destruction of the statue, the so-called Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said that those statues teach us about our past, with all its faults. To tear them down would be to lie about our history, and impoverish the education of generations to come. No, no, no. Those statues teach us about our past. No, they don't. They're just statues. To tear them down would be to lie about our history. No. In fact, the opposite is true. Edward Colston was not a nice man. Yet this, this statue in Bristol city centre, it made him look like, like a great individual, like someone who was worthy of being memorialised when he wasn't. And to go off topic here, I used to live near a statue of Oliver Cromwell, and when I was younger, someone said to me, oh, you know the reason why that's there? It's because he got blown up crossing a bridge nearby, and he died. No. Oliver Cromwell died of malaria in London, not crossing a bridge in the north of England. There was a little bit of truth to this story, in that, yes, the bridge did get blown up, but it was blown up a hundred years later, to stop Bonnie Prince Charlie crossing the river. And the only reason the statue of Cromwell was there in the first place was because he kicked the shit out of the place during the Civil War. But yeah, that statue, it made this guy believe something that wasn't true. Statues, they give a lie to our history. They lie about the past. They present false information like Edward Colston being this great man when he wasn't. And in fact as well, I would say this misinformation which statues provide, actually that does impoverish the education of future generations. Their presence impoverishes the education because it miseducates them. This coming from the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, saying that statues tearing them down is to lie about our past, is completely hypocritical. Not only because Boris Johnson is a known liar, but because he has also, on a number of occasions, lied about the past. In fact, his relationship with history is problematic at best. It was best put by the New Statesman in a review of Boris Johnson's book, The Churchill Factor. And they said that the ability to think historically deserts its author. In it, Boris Johnson claims that Winston Churchill invented the RAF, the tank, founded the welfare state, coined the terms Middle East and Iron Curtain, and is solely responsible for winning World War II. All of which is Bullshit. It also appears to be more about Boris Johnson than Winston Churchill, and it glosses over the fact that he was a racist, genocidal maniac, and a crap Prime Minister. And so was Winston Churchill. These lies about history, these false bits of historical information, this, this pseudo-history that Boris Johnson comes out with, it goes back to his days working on the Times in 1988, for which he was fired. The article he was fired for was a front page article on 
the discovery of Edward II's manor house in Southwark under what is now the um, City Hall in London. For a start, the article describes it as a palace, although palace is putting it loosely when it was more like a large manor house. It begins. Archaeologists working on an urban development site on the south bank of the Thames have discovered the long-lost palace of King Edward II. Alright, fine, that's basic, basic fact. They had discovered something, even though it wasn't a palace. They have also found the remains of the large house of Sir John Fastog, thought to be the model for the Shakespearean character Sir John Falstaff. Also, it was the same building, more or less, just renovated, and Sir John Fastog? There was never any person called Sir John Fastog. There was Sir John Fastolf, and he was one of supposedly the inspirations for Shakespeare's Falstaff, but not the model. The article goes on. According to Dr Colin Lucas of Balliol College, Oxford, this is where the king enjoyed a reign of dissolution with his catamite Piers Gaveston before he was gruesomely murdered at Berkeley Castle by barons who felt he was too prone to foreign influence. There are a lot of problems with this paragraph. Firstly, Dr. Colin Lucas, who was Boris Johnson's godfather. There are a million better people to quote from because Dr. Colin Lucas is not a medieval historian. There are people who are more expert in the reign of Edward II than he is. In fact, his most famous academic work is on the French Revolution, which took place 500 years later. The king enjoyed a reign of dissolution with his catamite, Piers Gaveston. Firstly, yeah, they were close friends, but there's no real evidence that they were at it, that they were ramming each other up the Emmerdale. That's just pure speculation. And besides which, Edward II didn't buy the rosary until 1325, 15 years after Piers Gaveston was dead. And it also seems to ignore the rest of his reign beyond Piers Gaveston. Gaveston was only, only around for a few years at the beginning, for four or five, before he was executed in about 1311, 1312. It just seems to jump from there to his murder in 1327, when he was rammed up the Emmerdale with a red-hot poker. It's important to note that this is the quote that got Boris Johnson fired from the Times. And not only in this article, but in a later article as well. He made it up, and then he used it again in another article. He used the same lie twice. The article then moves away from Edward II and it starts talking about the excavations of Sir John Fastog's house. It keeps using this term, Sir John Fastog, instead of Fastolf. There was no such person as Sir John Fastog. This is at best, a minor historical error. Uh, a case of not checking the actual spelling or the actual name of someone. His name was Fastolf, F-A-S-T 
F-A-S-T-O-L-F, not Fastog, F-A-S-T-O-G, as it is in the article. The discovery near the house of Riverfront installations suggests that Sir John was quite unlike the rumbustious, devil-may-care Shakespearean character. Rumbustious, devil-may-care. Not two words I would use to describe Falstaff. Fat, alcoholic, coward? Maybe. In 1460, it served as the home of the Duke of York's younger children, including the future King Richard III. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this... The winter of discontent has not yet happened. We have been betrayed. Quick, to Barnard Castle! This... This sentence is suggesting they they lived in the house, that they were there for a long time. And yeah, according to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, they were there from September 1460. However, in December 1460, thanks to the Battle of Towton, Richard III and his older brother had to flee to the Low Countries. So they were in the house for, at best, four months. They weren't exactly living there. They weren't exactly spending their childhood there, as is suggested by the article. And in fact, I would go so far to say that the entire article... It reads like a primary school history project, not not even a journalistic piece, let alone a historical piece. It reads like something a child would come out with. And this is on the front page of the Times as well. The front page of the Times. It's full of factual errors, it's misrepresenting the past. And like the Churchill factor, it's it's problematic. So I think we can conclude from this that whenever Boris Johnson talks about history, we should just not listen to him because his relationship with the past is not a good one.